fun times to, to get to debate and talk about the future of technology. And the challenge at that point is, you know, my background, I'm a data guy. I started, if you go back and if you've got a supplement book to, to the uh, 802.3 standards, I was one of the authors of the 10 base T standard. If you know what NetBIOS is, it started life as a thing called the Secondary Command Block Protocol, a company called SciTech. Um, came into this business to actually do IP, VoIP, and convergence on IP. What I found was the challenge was a lot greater. Um, it turned out that my best IP story was in about late 1999, I went to Coca-Cola and talked to them about voice over IP. We had a voice over IP solution. I came in and I presented it and the CIO of Coca-Cola looked at me and he says, boy, you must be crazy. <laughs> so what, what do you mean? He says, you know, the only damn thing that works around here is the telephone and you want me to put it on the data network? I can't call anybody when nothing works? So the net net was that, you know, if you look at convergence, it's been a challenge. In fact, I will argue that today we are in a similar challenge. Um, I took a slide out of here I was going to present about what I think the technology trends are. But I think there's some very interesting technology trends going on right now. Bandwidth is increasing at a fairly dramatic rate. Um, one of the things, if you go look at Ed Holmes' law of bandwidth, if you haven't seen it, it's worth actually taking a look at. It's the concept there are three kinds of bandwidth. There's bandwidth that's terrestrial you can get in your office. There's nomadic bandwidth you can get in hot spots in your home. And there's wireless bandwidth you can get every, anywhere. The ratio of those is about is 1 to 10 to 100. And they all increase about the same rate if you normalize technology. What's interesting is human beings actually have different I.O. capabilities. So think about text. Nobody can type faster than 300 bits per second. Nobody can read faster, faster than 5,000 kilobits per second. So text, once you get to a certain level in a network, text becomes easy. And if you think about voice, it's the same way. I mean, we have a definition of voice. What's really interesting is we are rapidly approaching the point where networks are passing through the layer of human perception in video or, or in, uh, in eyeball technology. And that's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. The whole concept of cloud computing, thin out the client at the edge and push things up into the core. You know, it's interesting, I, I actually brought my cell phone up here. You know, I used to have to do these debates and everybody would say, well, you want your life in your cell phone. Does anybody want their life in their cell phone? Where's my life? Where's my cell phone? Somewhere. I want this to be a cache. I want it to be a cache of what's important to me until the next time I can refill this cache. What's interesting is networks get faster and more available. And if you think about availability time, it's got really high. This cache gets a lot smaller. So some just interesting kind of core technology changes. So I kind of approached this, this discussion at a different level. I said, geez, you know, as a vendor of technology, this looks pretty scary. I mean, it, what our customers want is they want to interoperate with all this stuff. Um, you know, at the bottom, they want devices to interoperate. They want their, you know, room video systems that they put in as separate, uh, you know, really separate silos in their enterprises. They want their, the devices we provide. But the real explosion is right here in the middle. Um, you know, one of the quotes I love is, if you can't be the device you love, love the device you're with. Um, we're all going to have lots of devices. And that explosion is going to continue to happen. And what IT is recognized, they can't control that. Um, if you would kind of what I'll call the core, you have, you know, on this side, you have other enterprise communication of communication and collaboration vendors. And, you know, I'll talk in a moment about why I think that inner enterprise is going to be the real important focus of where this goes in the near term, um, near and long term. But then also the consumer communities. Um, you know, there are these huge com consumer communities that have emerged out there. And whether you know, it's Google or Skype on that side or these social communities over on this side, people want to interact into them out of their businesses for a lot of business reasons um, from the standpoint of them being customers but also partners. And then, of course, up at the top, we've got the carriers, um, the service providers that provide um, connections and services, whether it be the wireless carriers, the wireline carriers, or the what I'll call non-facility carriers like Skype. So, you know, looking at this, it's a, it's a pretty big challenge. And so I think one of the things that in the IMTC we need to think about is, you know, how are we addressing that challenge? How are we making it work in the right way? Um, one of the things I do want to talk about was video. So, you know, one of the things we've done and we've decided as a company is that the right way to manage this, this whole environment from customers is to create an experience that at a user experience level is designed to make it so that you can easily accommodate the world that's coming. So I developed this thing called Flare. It's a 
you know, it's a drag and drop user experience. It's got the concept of a stage with a spotlight that's a metaphor for the communication. There's a whole bunch of things that'll come in this space over time. But one of the key things about this is that it's a people first focus. We're trying to get away from the concept of phone numbers or addresses and get to more just the concept of people, introducing all of the different collaboration technologies together and making it multimodal. But one of the key things is that as we've gone out and talked to customers, they want that experience across their devices. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges right now is if you think about devices, different devices have different experiences, may have the same underlying data set, but it's a big challenge as I move between devices. So, you know, some requirements that we see that are important. If you want to be able to take experiences across devices as you're know, having open media streams, separate control and media realization, I think it's going to be very important so that you can actually control those separately and very much enabling open video. And I think, you know, if you want video to take off, um, open video is really important. Now, we believe, have come to the conclusion that SVC as a conceptual model for video, and this is based on a combination of really two things. One, believing that you need to carry the streams through the network to the endpoints. Um, you know, as endpoints get more and more intelligent, there's more and more capability in endpoints. The capacity of this device is improving. I'll make the argument that for major, most applications, I'm not going to put the big application out here. I'm going to put a user interface out here, but most of the application is going to be in the cloud because the network's fast enough. But all that power out here can be really used to manage the media streams. And that's really, I think, one of the things we've got to take advantage of as we go forward is move a lot of that media stream processing to the edge of the, edge of the network out of the devices where you can take advantage of that power when it's there. Um, and I'm not going to talk about SVC video very much in this context, but I think whether, however it's done with SVC, having a common video modality where nodes can transmit video into the network and they can be delivered to endpoints in a common way and manage bandwidth is really important. Um, you know, I, kind of going back to, to Ronald's slide, I, I thought it was kind of interesting in keeping with that communist theme, you know, from each according to his capability to each according to his need. I mean, it would be kind of the way I see this. So, I mean, I think this from our perspective is critical. And I think the reason is that video is driving things. But I thought this was a very interesting slide. You know, lots of people are planning on playing video, but look at that red dot. 20% of customers say video is a key UC decision maker. Um, a very interesting point. Why is that not a much larger number? Why is it such a small group of people really look at video as being not that significant? I'll make the argument that I don't think we really have defined the value of video yet. So how many of you are familiar with Chapanis and the work that he did in the 70s? Um, if you haven't ever read about Chapanis, you should go read about him. Interesting. So Chapanis was trying to define how human beings interact with machines. And what he did was he concluded that machines weren't smart enough to actually interact with human beings, so he actually used human beings. And what he did was he basically took a, a two rooms and he put a sender of information in one room and a seeker in the other room. So somebody had the instructions to put a barbecue together in one room and the barbecue parts in the other room. And he changed the interface between them. So he started off with teletype, electromechanical pencil. Then he added voice, then voice and teletype. And finally he opened a curtain with a glass window which essentially emulated video. And the concept was if you put a lot of subjects in the room with different tasks, you actually can measure the time to completion of the task is the goodness of the collaboration methodology to get a task done. And what he found was there was about a 70% plus reduction in time to task completion when you added voice. And what was very interesting, when you added video, it didn't go down, it actually went up. So the net net, his conclusion was that the way people should interact with machines, because interacting with machines was a task-based technology, was with voice. Um, very interesting. So kind of a data point. Makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if you think about a task, the concept of a picture is worth a thousand words, that's great, but it's a static thing. Human beings, when they're doing tasks, it's not a static activity, it's an interactive activity. We're actually going back and forth very quickly. Um, think about if you do, I don't know how many of you do a lot of IMs or a lot of texts. You tend to do those when they're relatively short information. Fast communications, fast interaction, task completion, you tend to use voice. Um, this is another study I think is very interesting, which is, this was actually a study in, of the EU um, back in the late 90s and of how people collaborate between different types of workers. So from the chair of a committee down through evaluators, et cetera, et cetera. And what you tend to see is that as you start up here at the top, you know, it's face to face, but as you move down here, 
people tend to use less face-to-face -face and more you know, email, voice, voice collaboration, et cetera. So what's interesting about this is that you begin to realize that Chapanis only measured one dimension of how people interact with each other, which was a task-based dimension. He didn't measure the other dimension, which was relationship. And he also didn't measure the fact that there are communications that are not task-based. So what I would argue is if you take those pieces of information and some other stuff, you can actually put together something that says you can map relationship from none to familial against modalities of communication based on the type of collaboration you're trying to do. So if you look at this, what this says is, you know, I have no relationship, we never met before, I don't know who you are, to familial, you know, on the far end. What it says is that there's a communication modality that says, if we haven't ever met before, face-to-face -face is important, but as our relationship develops, we actually go down in terms of our need for specific kind of communications. I mean, people, a lot of people say, get a team together, you bring everybody together, you have a first meeting, and then you can do a video conference, you can go to voice, you've moved on this curve. Um, eventually, obviously, on the far end of the curve, grandma wants to see the grandkids, so you get the grandpa, grandma modality. Um, what's interesting is there are within this, I believe, two communication or collaboration areas. There's selling collaboration. I, I, I would actually say this is, use the word visual feedback. Um, visual feedback, selling is not selling in the pejorative, but selling in the general. You look for visual feedback. Um, so, you know, I make a statement, I look to see what you look like when, when I make that statement. That's really important for certain activities. What kind of an activity would be really important for that? Obviously, making a sales call would be, but what else? Running a project team meeting, trying to sell your idea. Selling your idea, brainstorming, good example. Um, boards of directors? Think about people who sell all the time. Who sells all the time? Boards of directors, right? Low relationship, highly pervasive and persuasive environment. But what happens is as you move over here, you begin to move to a point where a lot of people, a lot of your activities are task-based collaboration. Um, in task-based collaboration, people have mutually, mutual goals that they both agreed on. One of the things with selling collaboration is generally in selling collaboration, people don't have common goals. Task-based collaboration, you have common goals. So very important to realize. The challenge with this is if you think about video, we really have today video that we apply in two dimensions. Um, the first video system we've done has done a lot of room systems. Turns out room systems typically got applied over here, right? And how much do you think they got used over here in task-based collaboration? Very little. And the reason was very simple. People realized they weren't adding any value to the collaboration. So, those room systems that were over here really, in a lot of cases, were applied in the wrong point. What happened then was we came out with telepresence, and telepresence actually is being applied primarily for those high selling collaboration spaces, right? True sales calls, connecting your, your executive briefing centers together, boards of director meetings, where you really need, you know, brainstorming, you really need that high, high value. Um, and kind of executive video. It's the next level down, that kind of desktop video. So what's interesting is think about selling collaboration for a moment. And if you're doing selling collaboration, what is important in video? Um, how many of you have an iPhone 4? How many of you use FaceTime on it? How many of you use it regularly? Two problems with FaceTime. On your, by the way, regular for business reasons. For, I, I, I'll modify it for business reasons. Two problems to my mind with FaceTime. The first problem is if you hold it at the right distance like this, it's basically a headshot. How much percentage of human interactive feedback communication is your headshot? About 20 to 30 percent. Turns out you're much less control over your seating position than you do over what your face looks like. If I tell you something that's very disturbing to you, you probably can control the way your face works, right? If you, if you ask me to do something and I tell you I'm not going to do it and you're very disappointed, you probably can control your face, but you're not necessarily going to control your hands and where you sit. I mean, how many times have you have gone into a meeting and you see somebody sitting there and they kind of lean back like this? Do you kind of know naturally what they're thinking? 
So the point is, the problem with that kind of video is you really need more than just a headshot. The value of telepresence is you actually get the larger view from the, from the table up and you actually see arm position, et cetera, which is really important over here in selling video. By the way, the other problem with, the other problem with FaceTime on this is the, uh, the fact that you start like this and you end up like this and it's nose hair video, right? I mean, the job is a fully challenged video. Um, actually, there's a great product opportunity for someone to make a headgear that you puts on your head and clips your iPhone right about there. It kind of hangs it off your head there. Um, just waiting to see that in the stores. Uh, so the point that's actually interesting here is that I believe that one of the big opportunities that's coming in video is what I'll call the occasional selling collaborator. Um, and it's actually fairly interesting. If you think about it, there are people that essentially don't use video all the time. And if you think about an organization, this is an organizational pyramid, um, and this is, by the way, that chart you saw on the previous page turned on its side. Um, what you see is the senior executives, board members, they essentially, any meeting is a selling meeting in a board. Um, if you look at senior executives in an organization, um, senior VPs, president, um, they generally are predominantly in selling collaborations. All of their communications, I mean, if you think about it, it's always, it's never a task-based activity. Let's do a task. It's always, are you going to deliver the revenue numbers? Are you going to do this project? Are you going to complete this on time? So video actually becomes very important there. On the other side, you've got a whole large swath of people down here that are primarily task-based. And for them, video is probably not going to have a lot of value. I mean, go into a manufacturing plant. I mean, there's not a lot of value for the guy on the car putting the, the screws in the, in the car of having video. But right here in the middle, there's a group of people that are what I call the occasional selling collaborators. And the difference there is that they only do selling collaboration a small percentage of the time, say 10 to 20% of the time. 80 to 90% of the time, they're focused on a task. So two product managers, when they interact with each other, 80% of the time, they're focused on a task that essentially behooves both of them. But 20% of the time, one product manager is trying to get the other guy to put a feature in that he needs for his product, but doesn't have any value to the product manager that's doing the feature. And he needs to be able to know that he's actually going to get that feature. How many times have you seen, you know, somebody says, I'm going to put the feature in. Six months later, when the product comes out, the feature's not there. The person who built spent a bunch of time building a functionality that's supposed to be on that feature comes back and says, what happened to the feature? You committed to me. He says, well, I didn't really commit to you. I told you I'd try to do it. And the way you could tell he told you tried to do it was by how he looked. By the way, just an interesting perspective. If you look at 50% of H323 video was actually implemented in Asia, Anybody know why that's true? Why is video much more, much more implemented in Asian societies than in Western societies? Because most Asian cultures don't have a strong word for no. It's how I look when I say something to you and how I say it. So if you ask me to do something in the US and I can't do it, I'd probably say no. In Asia, I don't say no because that basically you lose face if I say no to you, I lose face to so, so what I say is, oh, you're a very important customer. And we're committed to our mutual success. But this is very hard to do. But we are committed to doing the things that are important to support you as a customer because we are, so we are committed to our mutual success. What did I just say? No. <laughs> but we feel good about it. What I'll argue is the occasional selling collaborator, we all don't want to say no. Why do I not want to say no? If I'm a product manager, you ask me to put a feature in my product, I know I can't do it. I don't want to say no to you. Why don't I want to say no to you? What are you going to do if I say no? You're going to go to your boss, you go to his boss, come across here, the arrow from God's going to come down and screw up my program. So I tell you in a way that makes you believe I'm going to do it, but I don't do it with the deniability layer. Now what's interesting is, for every one of these people at this layer, imagine how many people they manage and how many resources below. And I'll make the argument that, you know, if you just take a simple number, 50 to 100 people on average, something in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent of the interactions defining, say, 1 to 2 percent of the work that's actually wasted, um, by adding video in here, we can actually dramatically change the way organizations work. By the way, just some very quick numbers looking at this, the, sa the savings here in organizational efficiency are almost an order of magnitude versus the savings up here in terms of things like travel. Because the big benefit of, up here of video is travel and productivity. Because they would have had a face-to-face -face meeting anyway, because they knew they had to be face-to-face. -face. So anyway, does it make sense? 
It's a thought process. So another area that I, I think is very interesting to think about as an industry is conferencing as a paradigm. So we are still treat telecommunications the way it was designed with the first telephone, right? A wire from a microphone to a speaker and a wire from a microphone to a speaker. And we've spent the last 120 years basically modifying that functionality. Um, and what we basically said is, you know, let's put in some relay switches, let's put it on to, uh, you know, put it into a, a switch network, um, let's put it into packets. But fundamentally, we have continued to support the same model. And what's interesting about that is that the argument is, well, most communications are between two people, so therefore that makes sense, right? And what happens is, when I want to do conferencing, I add in conferencing if a third party is necessary. Makes a lot of sense, right? Make the argument, I don't think it makes sense. Um, I'll argue that the opportunity to transform and make conferencing a paradigm and make conferencing the basis of communications is probably the next real opportunity. Um, and the value there is actually twofold. The first is that if you think about it for a second, 99.5%, 99.8% of any interactive communication is actually the media stream. And we spend all of our time thinking about the control to establish the media stream. We don't think about the value in the media stream. I think the value, much more of the value is actually in the media stream in the future than just in establishing the media stream. So, you know, if, if I make this as a collab, if I make a conference between, you know, two parties, I mean, as people come and go, it becomes really easy to bring people in and out. But what's more important is I can actually begin to bring resources in and out. So, you know, we, we think about recording. Well, very simple. You say, all right, recording. Why do I want to record what I say? Well, if I had a recording that said, if I said to you, you know, on a phone call or a communication, I commit to deliver this to you. Why shouldn't something be listening to that and say, here are the words I commit, and mark in my task folder that I made a commitment, take the next 45 seconds of sound, try to get out of what I committed to do, and mark that as a task. So actually, I've used the fact that there's communication collaboration in the media stream to actually use the media stream value. The other thing that's really important is that one of, I think, the major fallacies in SIP is how we do essentially transfer. Right? How do I do transfer? If, I've got, if, I'm on, if I'm party A and you're party B and I want to transfer devices, how do I do that in SIP? I tell your device to institute a transfer, which means you actually know what device I'm on. Personally, I don't think users are going to be that excited about having other people know what devices they're on and having it move that way. So the concept of conferencing as being a tether point for your devices, again, remember there are lots of devices, becomes, I think, a logical way of doing things. So my belief is that tether points are going to be, or these concepts of tether points are going to be pretty important. By the way, just as a side, we actually started this about five years ago in contact centers. Um, so the, AA, the, uh, the Avaya um, Aura contact center is designed with every communication in the contact center is now a conference. Um, turns out there's huge value in that, right? Because as you, you bring a customer, instead of routing a customer and agent, you tether the agent on a port in the conference and bring the resources to the agent. Um, what that means, for example, is if you've got a contact center first tier agent in India, you actually bring the contact, instead of transferring the call and sending it to India and then having to recover it to get it back, you actually bring the customer in, conference them at a conference bridge in the US, conference in the agent from India, and then when you want to do a transfer to a second tier or another resource, it's actually all managed within the country where the conference was. So very simple things. And it's very interesting. We talked to one of the guys who runs one of the largest conference, uh, uh, call center outsourcers. His comment was that it made conferencing into the way it should work. He said the way, you know, for example, you think about a Home Depot today, in the contact center sense, if you had a Home Depot, you'd walk in the front door, you'd get in a queue, and you say you wanted to buy a hammer, and they'd send you the hammer out where you get in the next queue to talk to somebody. Instead, you can actually now bring people in and randomize the resources. Um, so I think we need to think about that overall in communications. But I think the bigger issue that we're going to face, um, again, coming back to kind of this whole concept of interoperability, I think media streams, we can get those to interoperate. But I think our customers are going to ask us very quickly for something even more important. Um, how many of you think presence is important? How many of you think availability is important? How many of you think availability is more important than presence? How many of you want people to know your presence? How many of you want people to know your location? It's part of your presence. You want people to know that? 
where, where you are, so just anyone who wants to know it. There is a presence and availability is presence is, presence is information, availability is structured output based on preferences. So presence plus preferences equals availability. I will argue no one wants people to know presence. People want availability. And availability is structured by context. Who you are, what I'm doing, what device I'm on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's a very, very simple perspective here that people don't want other people to know information about them. They want that information to be used to give people capabilities. So if you think about the concept of a personal agent, and a personal agent to me is, a, is again one of these pejorative words. Um, you know, we all remember the, what was it, what was it, Fire, Fox Fire or something like that back in the late 90s that was the personal agent that would answer your phone and would, would interact with someone to find out who it was. Wildfire, Wildfire that was it. Um, the reality is that that was a personal agent. But I mean, think about personal agents as being things that represent me in the network. And it can be much more than that, because it really can be an algorithmic engine that does things for me. So if you think about personal agents, three kinds of personal agents. The interactive personal agent, it interacts not with the person that's trying to interact with me, but with me. So I make the decision. I'm the intelligence. So if you call and it, it interacts with me and sends me an IM and says, someone's on the phone or someone's trying to interact with you, what do you want me to do? I'm making the decision which means I've gotten interrupted. How many, how many times have you been in a meeting with someone and they do this? How does that make you feel? Mad. Very, very, very mad, right? What's worse is if they do this. Oh, hang on a second. Right? I mean, the perspective is, there's a couple of perspectives there. If they pick up the phone and look at it and, and hang the call up, it means that they've told that person that they're not as important as the person they're interacting with. What do you think about next time you try to contact them and you can't get a hold of them about their... Again, the perspective is people don't want to be interrupted. I think, why do people like I am? Because it's unobtrusive, right? You don't get interrupted. So the problem with the, problem with the interactive personal agent is you still have that interruption. Um, the second kind of personal agent is rule-based. So as you move down here, it goes from human intervention to more of the contextual data, right? Contextual data. So for example, I've had for years a rule-based personal agent that says from 7 in the morning to 6 o'clock at night, if you call my desk phone, it'll go to my cell phone. Um, but after 6 o'clock at night, there are about 10 people who can go to my cell phone. If I'm at a customer meeting, the only people who go to my cell phone are my wife, my children, and my, my admin. Anybody else, it automatically just goes to voicemail. I also have a rule set up, for example, that if I'm in a high cost area, the only people that go to my cell phone, for example, I'm in India where it's $2 a minute, are a certain smaller group of people. But what's interesting, if I'm in India and I'm essentially 9.59, I'm coming back from dinner and you try to call me, you would get voicemail. At 10.01, when I'm on my PC with an IP client, because now the rule changes, you actually would get me in my hotel room. So, you know, some think about what I've used there. I've used who's calling me, I have to find who's calling me, what device I'm available on, time of day, what I'm doing, and the cost of service to build a set of rules about my availability. And availability is what's important. The problem with that is, Everybody in this room could build what I just said. But you guys aren't normal. I can prove it to you. How many of you have a, digi how many of you have a digital camera? I'd be willing to make you a bet I can tell you how you store your digital pictures. Unless you use one of the programs from Apple or somebody like that. Um, what you typically have is a folder for every year. And in the folder for every year, you have a folder every time you took events off your camera. And what that means is it's really easy for you to find your pictures. How many of you I hit the way you store your pictures? <laughs> it's simple, guys. We're, we're, we're weenies. We're techno weenies. Ask somebody who's not a techno weenie how they store their pictures, and they'll tell you, oh, I read the camera manual, which you didn't do, by the way. And it said connect a USB cable from the camera to your PC and upload the pictures. And guess what? In 10 years, you end up with a flat file with 140,000 pictures in it, and you can't find anything. So the problem is we have to go to the next level, which is adaptive intelligence. And adaptive intelligence actually says, I will use intelligence of what you liked before to predict what you like in the future. So for example, when someone contacts you, you actually sort them based on how you think about people. That's a salesman. When I get called by a salesman or try to interact by a salesman, it only acts at certain times. So to my mind, this is where we have to get to over the next few years. By the way, if you, adaptive intelligence, anybody have TiVo? 
And if you have TiVo, TiVo does a good, a reasonable job of adaptive intelligence. What they'll actually do is they'll look at movies you've watched and they'll actually look at factors in those maybe like who are the actors and they'll use that to predict that if you watch four movies with, you know, pick your favorite actor or actress, they'll say you must like that and they'll actually pre-cache a movie with that actor or actress. If you watch that, it reinforces. So what they're doing is they're saying it's taking a set of characteristics. So for example, you know, if I interrupt you and then you get an IM back after the interruption saying, did you like to be interrupted by that person at that time? If I say yes, that reinforces that feedback loop. Um, but this really becomes, I think, the way we have to get to. We're, people are going to react very badly to what we're building if we don't do this. Um, I guarantee you they're going to turtle. Right? Turtle says you just stop answering the phone. I mean, how many people do you know who do that, who don't answer the phone at all, they let everything go to voicemail? or they don't interact. And what we want to do from a business perspective is interact with the right things. The other thing I think we need to be very focused on is, as a standards body is how do we do federation? How do we interaction between businesses? And I think there are two levels of this. There's a level down here, which is the media stream level. And we've talked a lot about that here. And I think one of the things that, again, going back to it's good enough, we need to get focused very quickly as an industry on picking some standards, agreeing on them, and implementing them. I mean, you guys got to, we've got to look at the consumer standards, consumer industry. The consumer industry learned their lesson in the beta, in the, uh, the beta and VHS wars. And since then, they pretty much typically pick standards. Get together, pick a standard, and go with it. And then you get widespread adoption. And as we get more and more into solutions that have to go across different enterprises, we have to do that. So in, for example, video media stream, we need to pick some standards, go with them, and drive them across the industry. The value is not going to be down there. The value is going to be, for example, up here. So you know, where we say is, you know, how can I do that presence availability capability across enterprises? How can I extend it so that you, know, you don't try to interact with me? When you go to interact with me, you know how you can interact with me. And you know, very much what I see is, you know, how can we provide that with lots of other vendors that are out there? I mean, that's what the customers want. And that's what's going to drive the adoption of this technology and them being willing to spend a lot more money in this space. I mean, the reality is there's technology dollars to be had in the enterprise. Just, just so you guys understand, cloud computing, data networking in the enterprise. If you look at telecom as a percentage spend of IT, it's a very small percentage of IT, today, IT spend today. Compared to the spend on core computing, on data networking, it's a small percentage. If you look at core computing and data networking, they're both coming down in spend. So enterprises are going to, are, the enterprise will have money to spend on things if we can give them solutions. If we make it complex and just do the things we've done before, they're not going to spend that money with us on these kind of communication solutions. <clears throat> 